whoops, there we go. So, I noticed that um, me and Keto tried a simul a couple minutes ago, and the, the audience demands more. They demand another simul. So, let's see. Uh, I think I got most of this set up and ready to go. Um, notice I got a new background here. Uh, Leech Us has this new feature where you can install backgrounds. So you can pick light mode, dark mode, and dark with custom background mode. So yeah, this is something new. I'm taking advantage of it, but I wrote my own um, stylish plugin that slightly modifies the background image. Um, just to make it a little bit darker so the rest of the screen's more prominent. And this is running with my other stylish plugins that just make the screen look awesome. So, anyway, we wanted to do a simul, right? Yeah, I like how it looks. Um, ooh, I could join an existing simul. Never mind that none of the existing simuls um, are in progress. So that probably doesn't make sense. Um, yeah, let's do a standard 960, um, what else do I want to throw in the mix here? King of the Hill, sure, why not? I think that's, well, uh, do I want to throw this in there too? I don't know. I'm really not decided on this. Well, yeah, three check I think is close enough. Other ones, I just don't know the theory, so we're just not going to do those. Um, do I have enough people for a simul? I don't know. Probably not. I mean, you know, I don't expect to have too many people, so I could throw in these other variants, even though I'm probably going to lose. Um, and, yeah, I guess... I like how this hint says, the more players you take on, the more time you may need. The problem is, I don't know how many players I'm going to take on, because I don't know how many players are going to accept my simul request. Um, so, yeah. I guess we'll give this a shot. We'll see how this goes. True Zug simul. All variants are on the table. Who knows what's going to happen next? I sure don't. Oh, right. So when I create these simuls, I shouldn't just expect people to look them up. I should actually type them into the chat to let the chat know, or I'm sorry, type this into the chat window so the viewership, let's use the correct terminology here, the viewership may know where you go to participate in said simul. All right, we got one person. Let's start. <laughs> okay. I wish it would let you do that just to be the ultimate troll, but you have to have at least two people or Leech Us will not allow you to start a simul. Um, just FYI. <laughs> yeah. All right. I think I can improvise this as a mouse pad. Yeah, who knew? So I've got this soft textured mouse pad, or I'm sorry, I've got this soft, I don't know, cloth isn't the right word, but it's not backed by its solid surface, so you can like roll it up. Such, I got this mouse pad, except, um, lack a hard surface uh, where my computer's stationed. So, um, 
I've now laid out a Chromebook on which I am um, placing my mouse pad so um, when I push my mouse against the mouse pad, it'll push back a little bit. All right, well, hey, we got a third. And I know my atomic rating is kind of high because I played atomic like uh, when this site first released it. And I was playing lots of one minute atomic. This is 2003. I think that used to be 2050, and then in the last three games I lost about 50 atomic points. I'm probably going to lose another 300 or so before my atomic rating stabilizes. Yeah. Well, it's not so much the host extra time, but it's really the increment. Um, because, I mean, if you've ever seen some high-rated players on Lee Chess give simuls. You'll note that they tend to be pretty lackadaisical toward the beginning, and they just make their moves and take their time and explain everything in great detail. And then, like, once they get toward the... once their time starts running low, they've still got 20 games remaining, and they've got a 15-second increment. Um, then problems happen. So in my opinion, this increment, plus 60, should kind of sort of depend on how many people actually join the simul. That's my opinion, though. Yeah, no, I expect that um, you're going to defeat me. Well, Dan Dan here is going to defeat me at Atomic. Well, you could also drop out and rejoin the simul and pick a different variant. If everybody really wants to play Atomic, we can do that. But I'm just saying I'm not... Like, if, in terms of playing somebody interesting at Atomic, I'm probably not the interesting person to play against. Alright, well, so we're starting to get close to... Um, is everybody ready? It's looking like I probably won't get any more people here. One thing I... well, I'm not going to point this out. I'll, I'll talk with folks over at Lee Chess and see what we can do to get that particular thing worked out. But um, Yeah, it makes sense to play standard. I think we're all ready. Um, yeah. I guess I haven't published this link in the chat since Trader Lynch joined, so I'm going to drop it in here one more time. And, oh, my OBS window isn't catching the chat. Try this again. If this doesn't work, I'm just going to remove the chat component altogether. Um, but it would be nice if it worked. So if I type something, bummer. All right, well, we're going to do this without the CLR browser plugin then. I'm guessing Knight's server is not paying attention at the moment. Um, so yeah, I think we're ready to go. Got three people. Um, and I guess with that, let's get started. Here we go. All right. E4, best by test. Atomic. Let's not forget which one's the Atomic game. All right. Uh, my noises are a bit loud. Let me turn that down so you don't go deaf. Alright, um, get this, back to it. Okay, E5, um, hmm.
I wasn't expecting that. Although, that's probably the main move. I think bishop g5 is playable. Right. Play some Scandinavian. Ooh, we get an Italian. We got an honest to goodness Italian opening here. You know, I don't know if I can pre-move in Simuls. Um, okay. We're going to play my variation of the Scandinavian. One where I just Fianchetto and Castle. And this avoids much of the mainline theory. Probably not objectively best, but it'll get me out of the opening. In one piece. Um, hmm. okay, I'm going to try something because, again, I have no idea how to play these openings. And it's only by trying things that I'm going to learn how to play better. Okay, so this blocks the bishop on c8, so it can't pin my knight. Um, so I think the other thing I want to avoid is having this bishop try to... Well, it's not so bad. Yeah, I think I just need to continue development. Where's my other bishop going? I don't want to move it to b2 because it's ultra cheesy to do the double fianchetto. It generally never works out. Um, I think tactically I can... I can't justify d4 without indu um, being susceptible to getting some pawn weakness when my knight gets pinned. So... Actually, well, yeah. I'm thinking about d4, bishop b4, queen d3, knight d5. I think I'm getting double pawns there. The way I proceed to avoid doubling my pawns is just play... Okay. So he saw the same idea I saw. Not surprising. Um... going to try something else. Yeah, I think that also is, seems playable. Okay. And I'm only blitzing out moves in this opening because like this is the one opening I played through all of high school. Um, strangely everybody in my area would, well, almost everybody would play this way with black. They'd play e5 and knight c6. Generally speaking, either bishop c5 or knight f6, or bishop e7, or some other random moves. And this, I just found, is a great way to get positions that your opponent's not familiar with. Oh, yeah, you guys, um, well, I guess we're going to start another simul once this is over, or something. Okay, this is... Yeah. And as much as I've said I've played this many times before, it doesn't mean I was playing it correctly, necessarily. Um, MCO gives that the critical line is knight takes pawn instead of just playing d5. But it's... Mm, I forget the evaluation of d5. That's going to haunt me for some time here. I know taking the pawn is playable, but I'm debating do I have better. No, I don't have better. I should just take d5. Get a small plus there. Okay. Yeah, so he plays knight takes h6, which makes a lot of sense. Um, and now... Again, I just don't know what to do. Um, I 
What is it that I should be doing in an atomic game? Seems like if I try to lay claim to space on the board, I just lose pieces. Um, Okay, well, this is a developing move, so it can't be too bad. Okay, so my big idea here was just to play bishop d2 to avoid doubling my pawns. I'm gonna go with that. Um, yeah, and I think after castle. Wait, if I castle, how close am I to transposing to book? Um, how close am I? Yeah, I think I'm good if I castle. In terms of book, I think I'm okay if I castle. We'll find out. So this is the move I've been dreading. Even though there really isn't much to fear, because I can just take it. Um, either take it or play bishop f3. I think I want open lines on the king side, so I'm going to take it. Oh, h6 is the move. Yeah, I just didn't see where the move happened. I saw the board switch, so there must have been a move. Um, so, I either castle queenside or kingside. But first I want to know where this bishop is going to be. Um, okay, this is atomic again. Should I be trying to stop? No. No, I should continue development. Trying to delay your opponent's plans, just not the best strategy ever. Um, you need to have your own plans to make any progress. Okay, I'm guessing that he's intending knight b4 and knight c2, but I think two can play this game. I'm not sure what else I should be doing here, because I don't see any decisive moves elsewhere. Yeah, I need to develop my knights. I think the best way to do that is knight a3. Okay, so this is where the bishop's going, the a5. Um... So one thought that occurs to me is I could push b4, b5, but why would I do that? The other thing is this h6 strikes me as something I might be able to take advantage of somehow. Um, b4 seems well-reasoned because this forces bishop b6, but then the bishop's well-placed on b6. Not the best idea. Um, queen e2, we might play knight d4, because we trade knights. That seems okay. I just castle position complicated, although I kind of give up my option of doing opposite side castling. But my bishops, like, if I were to do an all-out kingside attack with opposite side castling, none of my pieces are lined up to perform that attack. So yeah, we're going to castle. Oh! Wait, did I miscalculate something here? I don't think I did. So my big idea was queen h5 check. The only response is g6. Okay. Um, oh, now I see. I can't play the main move, which is pawn d5, in the other variation. So 
So I'm kind of bound to just take the bishop. Well, honestly, um, Nico, sir, you're, you're not going to encounter opponents who n have played an opening hundreds of times like I have. Like, that's the one opening I know. And even over the board in tournaments, I've misplayed it because I've forgotten some of the variations. So you're... I, time is best spent studying that which is going to help you in all of your games, not just in a small fraction of them. All right, so how do I improve my pawn structure? Um, I want to stop pawn e5, and this seems to be the only way to do it. Okay. See, this is the one, one of the pretty familiar atomic patterns. This is queen h5, g6. This opens the h6 square. Um, is normally protected by that bishop. Okay, yeah, I'll go over the Italian game after the stream, or after the simul. Um, like the one opening that I kind of sort of know, or at least I know lots and lots of cheapos in. But you know, if I actually cover that, then that means I won't be able to play it on Lee Chess anymore. That would be sad. Plus, it's not the most topical opening ever. There's plenty of ways to avoid it. Well, Atomic is pretty much all about calculations, so if you're not doing the calculation, it's not going to go so well. Um, or if you're just making errors in calculation, maybe picking something other than Atomic would be more fun. Part of the reason I was so hesitant to offer Atomic in the first place is because I don't have time to do much calculation. Um, and I'm sure an experience, or I'll, many good Atomic players would give me quite a, a difficult time in this simul. Um, so how do I continue developing? My knight's no longer pinned, so I have freedom to move it elsewhere if I want to, but I don't really want to move it to e4. On the other hand, I don't want to give up the d5 square either. Um, so uh, how do I keep going forward? I guess bishop f4 goes forward, but uh, it's interesting. We'll take our chances here. Okay, so castles. I've got a bishop for a knight. My c pawn is hanging. Um, I guess queen c2 is the appropriate move here. I want to move my queen. I don't want to hang my c pawn. Queen c2 seems to do a lot of useful things anyhow. Okay, knight g4. So we got the standard threat of bishop and knight attacking f2, and I could defend it with my rook, and then we'd have the ability to do that trade of two pieces for a rook and a pawn. Actually, I think favors white. So, yeah, I think I should do it. Do rook f1 to protect the pawn. And then find a way to continue developing somehow. Okay, what are we talking about? Oh, no! Uh-oh. We're down a game. Okay. Well. D5 
Yeah. Yeah, I've got this fancy little background I got from, I think, wallpaper.org. Um, basically, it's the same site that um, has all the... I'm sorry, Wallhaven. That's the website where I got this from. And then I darkened it a bit and made it into a CSS sheet just for my own consumption. I'm not allowed to redistribute it because I don't know, um, well, I'm allowed to use it, I might be able to stream with it, I don't know, I might have to switch it out for something else if it becomes contentious. Um, okay, so, oh, you wanted to go Bishop F5, yeah, I saw that too, let's, let's take a look at that game. So. Over, oh, it's actually my move. Okay, thanks for switching, Lee Chess. Um, yeah, I saw that Bishop F5 was a pretty key idea. Um, I've played this opening so many times that I know where all the shots happen. Or have a good feeling for where tactics occur. So, yeah, definitely I wanted to stop Bishop F5. That's just... Coming with the territory of me going first here. Um, what do I do about this knight? I think I just relocate it. Yeah. Got plenty of good squares for this knight. Doesn't have to stay on f3. Normally you want to keep a knight somewhere in the vicinity of the king just in case things um, heat up. But there are other places I could put this, so let's start dancing. Okay, we got e5 here. I was worried about g5. I didn't even see e5 coming. Um, it makes a lot of sense. So what do I do? Not good. Yes, forced is either bishop d2. Or some kind of crazy sack. Except I'm the one offering the simul. So crazy sacks are not as likely to work as if um, it's the other way around and I'm the one with all the time to calculate things. So yeah, we're just going to play the... Uh, I had the word for it. Cowardly move. Bishop d2 is what I'm playing. Oh. Okay. And again, I said, uh, like, I know where all the shots are pretty much in this opening. I happen to play it a lot. And one of the standard motifs in this particular variation is bishop a3 and bishop c4. And these are really monstrous bishops that just sweep the whole board, make it really difficult for black to occupy the center. Um, yeah, that's happening. What kind of hurts for black there is um, that I have multiple pieces attacking f7 as well. Okay, so this bishop here is becoming quite annoying and bothersome. Um, now prior to knight d4 happening, I was concerned that maybe the bishop might go to d4. Actually, knight d4, now black is kind of threatening to do c6 and bishop c7. So... Unless I find something better, I've got to trade off and get this bishop. Something better would be like if I could win the e-pawn outright. Uh, that looks too exciting for me. But yeah, I have h3. Knight takes knight. Queen takes knight. Oh, and then we might have this double exchange there, or I'm not sure. Oh wait, knight a4 would displace my knight, and knight takes knight check might happen anyway. Uh, so, my attempt to like try to trade knight for bishop, too optimistic here. Um, I, I have to kick this knight. And 
then try to deal with the aftermath. Unless they have some other tactical shots, but I'm not seeing anything. Yeah, I have to play H3. Oh, okay, so I'm just netting an exchange. Now, this was a three-player simul. Um, I just happened to get very lucky in um, the Atomic game. Yeah, I don't know how to do anything with backgrounds in OBS either. Um, okay, so we'll just take the exchange. And yeah, knight takes knight as expected. I want to develop my queen. So, unless I have a good reason otherwise, and I don't, I'm going to do queen takes knight. Alright, queen takes there. Um... Tricky. So to stop the rook from developing, I think I... It's actually trickier than I thought. Uh, yeah, so queen b3 is safe. Despite appearances to the contrary. Um, right? So queen b3, knight a5, bishop takes, bishop takes, knight takes, queen takes, queen takes, king takes. I lose a piece if I do that. Maybe I need to find an alternative. Okay, so this whole crusade on f7 is not working. Um, bummer. Really difficult for my knight or rooks to move anywhere without me hanging something. You control e5 and d4, so I have like a lot of dark squares controlled. Maybe I should just focus on controlling the center and trying to push through the center. <laughs> really aggressive. Um, also, rook a e1 just activates my rook. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah, let's just activate the rook. Okay, we got a knight of six. Um, Imperial's still level here. Still debating knight a4. I'm not sure how else I get some advantage here. Black's pawns are really solidly placed, and I can't double any of them. And... Um, as I was saying earlier, this isn't the most aggressive line white can play. Well, okay, if I play rook e1, there's bishop d4. And I'm not winning this e-pawn. And bishop e3 is just completely unambitious. And kind of weakens my king's side and blocks my pieces. So my only try to get some kind of imbalance would be to trade my knight for bishop. And the only time I can do that is before a move like a6 or c6 get played. So I have to do that right now. I have to do knight a4. Nothing else. Even, I'm not saying that knight a4 works, but it seems to be the only move that presents any problem for black. We'll try it. Okay. Now here I'm up in exchange. What I was thinking about. Um... So, I just need to trade until I get into an endgame, and then win the endgame. Uh, I think d5 is playable. I think I've seen it a few times before. Problem is that that particular line of the Italian, like when you th see the Italian, frequently you'll see players um, after this knight f6, you'll see d3. And this is the d3 is the boring line, the quiet, it's the pianissimo line of the Italian. Um, 
it's as boring as chess ever gets, basically. And I played instead the sharpest line, which is arguably a dubious pawn gambit. And there's book moves that go out to like move 20 or 25 or even further than that, explaining how to play that particular crazy gambit. Um, and objectively speaking, it's not good for white, um, but it allows me to get a position where I'm just happy to keep playing. So, my queen's attacked. Um, I don't have any clever tactics or any inner mezzos here. That's a little sad. So, yeah, as I was saying earlier, I don't know that the move I played works, and now it appears that surely what I played doesn't work. Um, so I want to do it as a gambit. Actually, do I have any choice? Uh, this is going to be one tough endgame. Um, unless I gambit the pawn. Might not be a bad idea. All right, we're going to play as aggressively as possible here. Uh, wait, does that trap my queen? No, it doesn't. It's close, but my queen is almost trapped there. It's a really terrible idea. Um, okay. I guess I have to do either queen e2 or queen d1. Queen e2 gets to a difficult endgame. Um, queen d1 allows me to stay in the middle game. It costs me a pawn to stay in the middle game. And I'm not liking my chances there. So we're going to go queen e2. We're going to get this really sad endgame and try to salvage it. All right, so said that he who trades first loses ground or gives ground, but I'm not sure how much I care. But I really like my knight. I don't want to trade my knight. But if I do trade my knight, I can get into an endgame. Going back and forth on this a lot. Um, I need to trade so that I don't get checkmated. Um, and here I need to trade so I could get into an end game. It's going to be a sad end game. Do I go to e4, e3? I'm thinking e3. This gives me more flexibility to kick around the queen if I need to. Although, why am I even going on the e-file at all? Um, because I need to activate my f-rook. The only way to do that is by lifting 
by e -Rook. Could play f4. f4 would be definitely a space grab. A bit risky. What's my long term plan here? My long term plan is to make use of lines on the queen side. So I'm going to start that plan with rook b1. Okay, kind of sad. I didn't think I would be in direst straits so soon here. Um, okay, so I have to take the bishop if I want a halfway reasonable endgame there. Um, And I think now I seize the e-file as well. Both my rooks are in open lines. It's a good, reasonable, positional approach. Um, I missed some tactics here, so it looks like I might be giving a pawn for some compensation. Well, no, maybe I have rook c1. Maybe that gains a vital tempo. I'm not, I don't even know if I want to go there, but my choices are rook c1 or bishop c3. I'm sorry, my options are helping either rook to c1 or playing bishop c3. In either case, um, developing here. Say so you shouldn't move pieces twice in the opening. In fact, if I do rook c1 though, it just takes d3 and my bishop's hanging. I don't have any good response to that. So, yeah, we're going to play this endgame. Rook d8. That makes a lot of sense. Um, black is playing sensibly. And. Challenging for white to win this, but we're going to try. Um, and this is the sort of reason I was looking at f4 earlier. Um, okay. Well. I want to maximize my peace activity. I don't want to create any holes or anything, but um, I'm trying to move my queen to help centralize it. I haven't decided where. Tough end game. Not as tough as the other one. I just happened to get lucky here. But um the whole time I'm debating should I be playing A4 or not. Now I need to play A4 to create some weaknesses. Problem is a double-edged move. We're playing it. Let's see what happens. Oh, c6. 
Now I have an option to defend my pawn. Actually, why don't I choose both? I could double the pawns and then defend my pawn. Because the bishop pair is something so desirable here. And yeah, that is a pretty awesome bishop. And having the bishop pair in a wide open position can be useful. But double pawns too? Uh, um, Difficult to decline that opportunity. Um, I think doubling the pawns is the only way I get any imbalance that might favor me. But it, I have tons of weaknesses too. That's not changing, is it? Yeah, this D pawn weakness is going to create all kinds of problems for me. Nothing I can do about that. Other than playing D4 right here, right now, or maybe next move. Um... Maybe that's what I should be trying to do. Try to activate my pieces. Okay, knight a5. Well, I was trying to get more people to play. Um, it wasn't until like 10 minutes into the simul that people showed up in my stream. Um, or 5 to 10 minutes in. So... Uh, I did stick around waiting like 10 minutes before starting it. I didn't know how long to wait. Um, so I, how do I develop here? And black's threatening to develop as well. Move my queen to a more central spot. I'm going to take a detour to get there, I think. Well, no, it's not necessary for me to detour. I have some tactics which should. Yeah, that endgame should be winning. I can just play queen e4 here. Um. Okay, this is what I hoped for, is that I'd have just the one tempo I needed um, to put my pieces on better squares. So, I'm debating. Do I take the knight? Or do I do what I was thinking of doing? Okay, we're going to go ahead and with my plan, which is just centralize the bishop. Okay, and the tactics to which I referred have to do with this move, queen e7. Point being is even if queen d6 happens, um, still able to trade queens and play rook e7 with tempo. And that should be enough. Yeah, I saw bishop b3, I wasn't so afraid of it, because I could just play rook d2. Oh, um, I guess just a word of advice, like, the Italian's not the easiest opening to learn. Like, if you're going to study and openings, I wouldn't start with that one. Okay, we're going to live dangerously here and play d4. That was my plan. It was bishop e5 and then d4. 
now I have something that's worth trying to play out here. Um, Okay, is rookie one a bad end game or a decent end game? Not an end game. He just plays F six. Um. Okay. So what else? I think bishop F four is fine. Okay, we're still thinking on that one. Um, a couple times by now, Lee Chess has not switched the game when it's my move on the other board. So I'm kind of... It becomes my responsibility to look at both games. Um, not sure entirely what's up there. It might be my browser. Or it might be leech us for all I know. Okay, B five. So for sure I've given up a lot of squares. Um best place I can move my rook at the moment is C one. I think I should just go there. I think this is how I untangle myself. Yeah, and as I was explaining, I can play rook e7 with tempo. That's what I'm going to do. Okay. This, yeah, this, um, this is tricky. I was worried that something not necessarily this, but something like this might happen. And it's difficult to make progress here. Um, I guess I have to shuffle my pieces about a bit. We'll do that. And pretend that everything's A-OK -okay there. Should have thrown in rookie 8. Rook e8 would have been a decent idea. Yeah, I didn't see knight c4 until after I moved, and as soon as the board switched, I saw knight c4. Um, I think I'm not dead. I think I can play rook d3. Sure hope I can. Um, okay, and I switched boards again, and oh, rook c6. Damn. Um, okay. That really complicates this. So I should have thrown in rookie eight. I might now might be my chance to play rookie eight. Uh, not good. We have to play rookie eight. I'm not sure what happens next. Um, where do I want my bishop? No avoiding some trade of my bishop. Well, no, I could go to b4. That would avoid a trade. Highly unusual, but it's legal. Um, and yeah, now how do I develop without dropping material? That's a tough one.
Most of my candidate moves don't work here. Oh, I'm sorry. Now I see a tactic. So I have to be afraid. Um, uh, that's not good. Okay, I suppose rook c1 is my only sensible move here. So I don't hang material. Oh! That's what I was missing. Okay, so I've given up a pawn. Um, I was wondering why did that bishop trap itself? I just could not connect the dots. This makes a lot more sense. Um, okay, I don't see everything that's, I don't even see half of what's going on here. But I think rook c3 is necessary. Tactically. Okay, yeah, a5. Um, now I need to activate my king, right? Now, tactics demand that I do things other than that which I want. So I think I have to continue Rook E2. Battening the hatches so I don't lose material. Um, okay, and here I was planning Rook C5. I feel, still think it's my best move. No, it's not. Well, no, it's fine. C5 is a okay here. Yeah, this rookie one was the last thing I saw before I settled on rook c5, and then I saw I could take the rook. Um, pity. Um, yeah, got rook d6. And many say the rest is technique, but it kind of is true here. If I don't show some technique, then nothing's going to happen. Um, I'm evaluating, is rook e7 knight e2 winning? Only if I can grab two pawns while he grabs one. Um, the rookie seven might be two. Uh, gotta take c7. And things are not clear at all. Oh, wait. Okay, after I take c7, I think I can defend everything. This just wins a pawn? Maybe? Um, I have to try it. I don't see any better alternative. Yeah, sorry, John, but uh, turns out in a game of chess, um, you have an opponent, and the opponent gets to make moves, too. Often forgotten fact. Um, okay, yeah, I didn't look at c5. 
And I'm not good enough that I could just say, oh, well, I just didn't look at it because it doesn't need to be looked at. You know, it, it's an important move here. Um, not that good at chess to say that I just instinctively know how to play all these things. Um, Well, this endgame keeps looking more and more drawish. Um, seems like if I do anything other than pawn takes pawn, well, yeah, there's no way to hold this together. Um, like if I do rook d1 to try to hold my center, there's knight b2. I don't think that works. Um, I think I should take c5, then take f7. Well, there are some fun tactics. Um, that's so incredibly sharp, I'm afraid to touch it. Um, Yeah, I've got to just take this pawn. And then, um, do I take f7 or do I attack the c pawn or a pawn? Um, I think if I don't take f7 now, then this will just be... I think taking f7 increases my winning chances. Certainly gives my rook more places that it can move. Problem is that my a pawn might go. But difficult to defend my a pawn in any event. Uh, I mean, regardless of how the game plays out, I am going to analyze this afterward. Um, so we might as well play it out. Um, my analysis by myself can't be as good as us working on this position together. I think at some point I'm forced to play my H pawn. I keep debating whether it's going to be the H or the G pawn. I don't know. Um, it might be the G pawn. That would keep my king somewhat close to the center and sheltered. Um, and. Assuming that I do play the g-pawn, my king is just barely close enough to stop... Well, no, it wouldn't stop the a-pawn, though. So, maybe I should just um, say to heck with the A-pawn, I think I'm okay. Maybe I need to worry about just peace activity. I think that's what's going on. So my main line runs rook takes pawn, knight b2. Um, and I try to activate everything and once the knight goes to b2 I just play rook a7 
The rook takes f7 is just a completely free pawn. That's what keeps drawing me back to this, is that I can take f7, and it doesn't hurt my chances elsewhere. It's very unusual in a rook endgame where one player has two rooks. Um, oh, I'm sorry, in a rook endgame or rook and minor piece endgame, it's unusual to just give a tempo like this. Usually the tempo is worth more than the pawn. But here, just because all our pieces are incredibly locked up and not threatening very much, um, Pawns actually worth more than a tempo. Oh, and of course, now that I play this, after hemming and hawing over all of this, I see that I don't even have to exchange a pawns. I'm able to defend my a pawn. Yeah, several dif or two different ways here. Um. And this is the ultimate justification for what I did. Rather, it's the best possible justification is that I take the pawn and I still get to keep all the pawns on the queen side. Um, so this rook is threatening to attack my c pawn. So what I have to... Okay, maybe I'm overstating things. Might not be so simple. But it feels simple. Um, it just bothers me that black could potentially get two passed pawns if I'm stupid here. Okay, so my a-pawn is safe for the moment. Uh, like, if I play rook a1 and rook d3 happens, my a-pawn's safe. The pawn's loose. But the only thing attacking the a-pawn would be the knight. I can force the knight to move, and then I can go back and defend my c-pawn. No, this doesn't actually defend the pawn. Tactic stand. Um... So we're going to go what I just most recently saw, rook f4, and I do have a follow-up here. Yeah, c4 is going to happen, and then I'm just going to follow with rook d4. And the idea is that my rook's centrally placed. It denies black's rook access to my c-pawn. So if a rook trade doesn't occur, then there's no attack... In, well, then my c-pawn's just safe. And if a rook trade does occur, then even if he takes my a-pawn, I take the c-pawn, and I should be winning that endgame. Um, but if the rook moves away, then I have time to play my rook back to a1, I think. At any rate, my rook is really nicely placed on d4. Yeah, yeah, I... Honestly, I almost felt... I, I wouldn't have taken the knight if you did knight takes a4. I mean, I would have suspected something at that point, but I almost played right into just giving um, back rank mate for the pawn. I'm sorry, giving the pawn up and not seeing the back rank made at the time that I offered the pawn. So, this was the best possible scenario. Even if I try to defend the pawn, it's going down. There was no defending it. Um, but, at least my pieces have gotten pretty active. And even though we're trading a pair of pawns, and thus increasing drawing chances, also... Um, well, potentially giving black a past a pawn. 
Um, I was doing okay here. All right, so now the A pawn's defended. Now I've got all my pawns. Yeah, I think the most testing move is probably knight takes a4 anyway. Knight takes a4, rook takes c4. Black has a passed a pawn. We're that much closer to trading off all the queenside pawns and things getting difficult. But um, not like this is any walk in the park either. Um, Because I still need to find a good move here. Where's this rook going? Actually, honestly, a good question. Um, The okay, thing I just looked at here was rook b1, knight takes pawn, rook takes c4, knight b6, rook takes knight, just to see if rook takes knight is transposing into a winning endgame. In my opinion, that endgame, a pawn versus c pawn, dubious. Uh, it might be winning, but I doubt it. If, if it is winning, it's only by a hair. And I surely have a better alternative. So, uh, I guess my rook's going to do a little dance here. Uh, it takes three moves. Actually, two. Wait, where did my rook come from? Oh, my rook... Okay. I'm all confused because my rook came from f4 to d4. I was so proud of moving it to d4. Now I'm debating moving it back. Ah, uh, the tactics like d5. I don't want to go there. I really don't. Um, yeah, yeah, that's the conclusion I came to. I was just afraid that what if the rook actually is going somewhere. But clearly it's not, or at least not on the e-file. So... I'm afraid of some piece invading my position. It's not going to be the rook. Um, hmm. Okay, well this is... Ex oh, I don't play rook d7. That's kind of bad. Um... So yeah, I think I see my best move here. It takes a while to unwind, doesn't it? I'd love to get my rook on e5, but a bit of a stone's throw away from where I'm at. Um, So do I go up or do I go down with my rook? Because I considered f4 and I saw knight d5 and I freaked out, stopped calculating. Actually isn't how you're supposed to play chess. You're supposed to calculate. Um, so we're looking at rook f4, knight d5, rook f5, knight c3, rook a5. Um, 92, 5, C3, A5, I don't like it, um, there's got to be something better, I think I see something, so, um, 
It's going to take a long, long time to unwind, but I think I see how to do it. Oh, I'm sorry, when I said F4, I meant to say Rook F4, if I didn't say that explicitly. Yeah, I'm not pushing my F pawn, because I don't want this Rook to invade. So my big idea, I still don't know how good it is, is to oppose the rooks here. Hang on. King, rook, knight are all on the same line. Do I have anything I can do here? No, I don't. It'd be cool if I did, but I don't. I'm going to go with what I was planning and plotting. Um, Hopefully this won't danger me too much, but I think I know what I'm doing. Yeah, the point is twofold. Both to give my king access to new squares, and to hit the A pawn. Um... I think the latter is more important here. All right, that's the simul, guys. Take a look at this game. Um, so, yeah, aside from the early opening, I don't know what happened in the Atomic game other than um, I got this Queen H5, H6 motif in that I've played in Bullet many times, but... Um, okay. Oh, and yeah, in the John Robbs game, curious what went wrong there. But um, Re Nico's waiting on me here. So, let's start with Nico. Um, The computer going while we're going here. Um, oh, you wanted me to speak to the Italian. Yes, yeah, so this is the Italian game, classical variation Greco Gambit, traditional line. This um, be playing d4 this early, allowing bishop b4 check, which is the book move. Um, got knight c3. I think d5 is playable. I think that's fine. Um, the line I'm most familiar with runs knight takes e4, castle, bishop takes c3, and then d5. And all kinds of mayhem ensues here. White's down a piece and a pawn at the moment, um, but white's compensation for this is just incredible. Not good enough for the pawn, but it presents black lots of problems, particularly... Go back. Um, so... Yeah, knight c3, knight takes e4, castle, bishop takes, and then d5. is the most exciting line, in my opinion. Even though, theoretically, this is not sound. Um, oh, okay, John... Uh, shoot. I hate to have obligations to multiple parties here. And... Okay, I know this analysis, sure the computer's done analyzing, but the way we analyze the rest of this game is going to take a long, long time to just to figure out everything. Uh, how did the evaluation graph look? Okay, so here we're at plus two. Yeah, after we're plus two, oh, apparently this dips to 1.5 at some point here. Spikes way up at the end. Um, that's going to be really involved and complicated. I would prefer to get back to that, even though I really want to analyze this game. Oh, but John says he can wait. Okay, so we'll go through this then.
Um, okay, so yeah, your comment is that you want to deploy knight takes e4. You know, by the way, just because the computer says d5 is a bad move does not at all mean that the computer is right here. Like, I was willing to play into a gambit, which theoretically is like half a pawn, maybe even a pawn worse for white. And Stockfish, um... Okay, so Stockfish thinks that it's minus 0.1 before knight takes e4. Stockfish didn't know that I was going to play this crazy d5 move. He has no concept of how this opening goes. So I was prepared to go into something that was minus 1. Just because it says this is plus 1 doesn't mean that the computer's right. Um, so, now let's keep going because I don't want to get bogged. Well, you wanted me to explain the Italian opening. So, yeah, after d5... Um, the main line goes bishop f6. You might ask why. Why is it so important to keep this bishop? Like, why can't we just um, play this, and then we can attack the bishop and win a piece? And then we just take here, take there. We got this queen fork. That's okay, right? Because we're able to protect each other's knights, and knights protect each other. You'd think this would be okay for black. Um, but after queen takes g7, things are not so happy for black after all. So that's why knight e5 trying to win this bishop isn't the main move. Um, and in principle, I guess black just wants to keep the bishop pair. Um, but after bishop f6 happens, then white continues development. After all, he is down a pawn, so he has to keep developing. Um, pins the knight. Still threatening this knight and threatening that knight. Um, theory says that black should play knight e7 here. And then white takes the knight. Black pulls up the center so this pawn blocks the bishop. And um, white tries to bring more pressure to bear on e7. After which, uh, well, black's got a couple of, I, I think the main line is you take the bishop. White takes back. Black has the option of attacking the knight to try to kick it away. Uh, the alternative is black castling, after which knight takes h7 leads to a draw by perpetual check. Um, okay. How do I get the text to be a different color? Um... I have a CSS plugin that's uh, used, I'm sorry, a CSS uh, cascading style sheet that's being run through the stylish plugin. Um, in fact, I should link you to um, the style itself. You will need some kind of browser plugin to render that style every time you visit LeechS, but style itself can be found there. Um, yeah, this is like why I'm saying, okay. You can blame opening knowledge, but this is possibly one of the most confusing, um, or one of the most uh, full of potholes openings that there are. Um, yeah, say so after h6, it goes queen e2, pawn takes knight, rook e1, piling up on the e7 square, and this. I mean, if that goes, Black's entire position starts falling apart across the 7th rank. So, to counter that, Black actually puts the bishop in the way of the pin. White takes back, and then this is threatening to open up the king's side, so Black has to consolidate the king's side this way. And then White plays rook e3, followed by rook h3, and this is just not at all a comfortable position. Even though, theoretically, this is probably worse, or much worse for white, it's difficult to play. <laughs> um, so this all goes back to, well, so this is the main line. This is how black plays if he's going for an advantage against this gambit. Um, but let's back up a few. Because I'm making it sound really hard. Um, but that's just because that's the main line, is this bishop f6. This is how black tries to win. Um, black can actually just 
play for an equal position by trading here and then just backing a knight back. And this position is like completely dead even. Um, I had a game against somebody on Lee Chess here. Uh, game went for about 40 or 50 moves. And he played, I think he had like 5 cent upon loss or something. And he was moving very quickly every move. And even against that kind of opposition, I was able to play reasonably with white here, even though this is like just equal. There's really nothing going on for either side in this position. White's down a pawn, but white controls the center a little bit better. But, I mean, does it really matter? Um, that's pretty equal. Um, there are several other ways to equalize, but... Um, so yeah, those are the knight takes e4. Is there any alternative? Because I know we were looking at d5. People have played this against me over the board, and they've done pretty well with it. But I'm not sure, like, what's going on here either. But yeah, knight takes e4 is the main line. Um, and, yeah, it's because of things like this, I just don't understand why people ever play the pianissimo when they can play all this fun stuff. It's really not that hard for white, because black never knows it. Um... Yeah, you're welcome, Lokal. Um, I'm curious, why is d5 so bad? Or why does Stockfish think so poorly of it? Because, I mean, black controls the center, pawns are equal. What am I missing? Okay, maybe white's ever so slightly better developed, but why is this plus one? It makes absolutely no sense to me, and I've played similar positions many times. Obviously, you can't take c3. Um, the most obvious reason is just that I have queen e1 that can pick up the knight. The other thing to be concerned about in some of these lines is queen b3 hitting f7. Um, so yeah, castling is correct. I mean, this all looks good for black. Um, I really... I disagree with Stockfish about this evaluation. This looks a-okay. I think everything's fine. I don't know, like, why Stockfish is so pessimistic about this. Maybe because I'm threatening h7. Maybe he's just worried that something's going to crop up suddenly. But, um, I think black is just a-okay. Sure, I've got two pawns in the center. But... Black hasn't gotten any pawn weaknesses, and I have no way to double Black's pawns. So how am I supposed to make any progress, even if I control the center? I just don't understand. So yeah, that's kind of my take on the opening. Um, Bishop g4 does cross across the half line, across this fourth, fifth rank. This is aggressive. Um, Stockfish penalizes black by half a pawn for that. That might be a bit harsh, but um, I know black really wants to develop that bishop. I'm just worried that with black playing so aggressively... Um, oh, I'm sorry, the thing that I guess bothers me is that I was able to move the knight away, and this bishop was misplaced. Like, what's it going to do here on g4? Um... There might be better places for the bishop. This is just me nitpicking quite a bit, because bishop g4 is okay, but I just think black might have better places to put the bishop. So I guess, um, in the name of good development, well, one thing white would like to do eventually is play bishop f4. And one way you could kind of deny that is with a move like queen d6. Oh, but there, uh, I'm thinking about, like, is there any way to make that happen? Um, that's really scary. Queen d6 is too risky. Um, okay, so what else can black do? Yeah, I was just really surprised that, um, 
like bishop g4 kind of says that um, you're going to chop on f3. And that, unless I move that knight away and start exposing my king, um, that, that um, I'm just going to get double pawns. And my reaction when I saw this bishop g4 is, well, I don't want to move my knight away because then I might get mated. And what did I deserve to... Why am I getting mated out of this opening where I was offering to give up a pawn and where I kind of have better pawn control in the center? And that just didn't click at me or with me at all. Like I didn't understand how I could possibly be in some king danger right out of the opening when I don't think I did anything wrong. So this bishop g4 is kind of seeking to punish white for playing too aggressively or something, but I thought that I was okay here. And I guess as I'm looking at this again, I'm kind of wondering why didn't I just play knight d2? Play knight d2 and then I could play like f3 and obviously I can't play f3 right away because of the knight fork on e3. But was it necessary to go to g5? I don't think it hurt anything, but e2 just seems a whole lot more flexible and safe because I might want to move my knight somewhere other than e4. Um, yeah, so there's some discussion here. Let me see if I can get the chat window open. Does this render yet? Probably doesn't. If Nightbot's awake or the night chat server is active. So I'll try this once more. Test. Yeah, it's shoot, it's still not responding or not catching the text. So oh hang on. That took a grand eternity, but I think I saw it say something. So anyway, yeah, there's some discussion here. Um, among the viewership that just play g6. And okay, this kind of weakens black's uh, dark squares, but it would at least give you access to f5. I don't know. Double edged. Um, actually, yeah, I guess that looks reasonable. I don't really have any mate threats because all the dark squares are pretty well covered. Both Black Knights are on light squares, meaning that they cover dark squares. Um, plus you could shuffle... An, I mean, all my pieces are misplaced if I'm, my goal is to try to do a kingside attack. It's just not happening. Um, what do I do against g6? Well, okay, some one idea that crops up quite often in this opening is just bishop a3. Um, might be even better on a3 than on h6. The other thing I might be able to do is just bishop g5. Then we might see knight e7. Uh, I'm scared. Um, knight e7 doesn't work. Maybe the other knight to e7. Another knight to e7. Um, that doesn't work either. So, yeah, this bishop g5 is actually looking kind of serious. I didn't think it would be that serious. Um, black doesn't want to play f6, but it seems the only alternative is queen d6, which might be fine. Maybe this is not where my bishop belongs. And maybe it's just as bad as the bishop g4 that we were looking at earlier. Um, yeah, what's my bishop doing here? It doesn't belong there. It belongs in a3. Um, but yeah, another thing you might consider here is knight e7. And you can solidify your knight with c6. And you also have access to f5 this way. Um, 
not uncommon for uh, the Italian opening to result in black getting knights on b5 and b6. But, I mean, given that it's kind of tricky to accomplish here, I mean, like, getting your other knight to d5 might be tricky, is what I'm saying. Uh, supposing I do this? Yeah. Doing this maneuver probably doesn't work so well, so I'm suggesting this, in lieu of being... Actually, now you just play c6 and then shuffle the knights this way. That's the safest way to do it. And this just barricades on the light squares. Um, yeah, so another alternative we're suggesting here is bishop e6. Um, I think this isn't what you want to do. Because now we've got a double attack. Um, Yeah, I don't think See, Bishop E6 would equalize if I just didn't have so much initiative here. Um, like Knight G5 is pretty much my only move to get any imbalance here that might even. So like Black has no pawn weaknesses whatsoever, right? And White has a really strong pawn center compared to no pawn center for black. But black hasn't made any concessions. No double pawns, no backward pawns. Everything is really solid in terms of the pawns. There's really nothing I can do to weaken them. So in exchange for having made no concessions, um, black is allowing me a bit of activity because all my pieces can float pretty much anywhere. Um, but yeah, if you were if you had time to like get the bishop to e6, and I didn't have any kinds of shots here, um, yeah, you would have pretty much equalized because my pawns can't go anywhere. Once your bishop lands here, once your knight moves somewhere else, and once c6 gets played, you just dominate all the light squares, and there's nothing white can do. Um, it's because of that that I'm forced to play aggressive kinds of moves like knight g5. Um, because if I don't do that now, the moment's lost, and we're just playing an equal position where white has weak pawns and has no initiative if he doesn't use it. Yeah. But yeah, bishop e6 would normally be good, but just tactically here it doesn't work. So we looked at five options here. I think ultimately, um, yeah, knight to e7 is probably the best. It's going to take some time for black to unwind with c6, and um, I'm not sure how he's going to manage to barricade on c4, but it probably won't be that hard. Um, and I'm not sure what white's supposed to do. Like, obviously I have to attack something somehow, um, but yeah, I don't know. Maybe I just didn't go and play bishop a3 yet again. The difference here is that after bishop a3 you have c6, and so even supposing... Okay, which knight do I want to try taking? I guess it doesn't matter. Even supposing I take d5, now I have a backward pawn on c3. So, like, I could try to get generate some kind of activity here, but my pawns are in dark squares, my bishop's on a dark square, so this isn't so good. The alternative being taking this knight, um, and again, the more pieces that get traded, the weaker these pawns get. So... Um, that's why I'm saying, like, after bishop a3, c6, okay, black's tied down, okay, it's uncomfortable, but at least nothing's being lost. So, 
Sure, I can stir up some activity, but eventually it's going to peter out. Um, I mean, it has to, right? Uh, I don't want to move knight f6 again. d6, I suppose. And finally, I've coerced some kind of weakness. Um, although that's not necessary. This is possible. Um, and h4, h5, or maybe h6. h5 looks reasonable. Queen d1 to hit this pawn. Um, f3, uh, bishop g4, f3, and like, okay, black is still kind of sort of in a bind. Made one single pawn weakness, but black should be fine. In fact, he's probably forking me here, so I can't get away with f3. Um, meaning queen d1 doesn't work either. Um, this is probably okay for black. It's going to take black some time to unwind here, but um, I think he's doing fine. So I guess back to the game now that we're done beating a dead horse. Um, yes, I played knight g5. I mean, this looks really menacing, but I've just got two pieces attacking. Bishop out here is pretty well blocked by the knight. Um, so, wait, why was knight f6 bad again? Oh, right, because bishop a3 and f7's loose. Um, it's not an easy tactic to see. Okay. After this, I won the exchange, and okay. rook b1 was not my best move. Yeah, I hesitated a lot here. I was like, should I do rook e4, should I do rook e3? I ultimately settled on rook b1, because even if this isn't objectively strongest, even if this squanders the tempo by allowing black to play b6 with tempo, um... I felt that inducing this pawn weakness would at least make it easier for me to calculate where the targets were. Whereas until one of these three pawns moves, I can't know which one to attack. And I'd be spending a lot of time calculating. But now once b6 is played, um, then it's pretty clear that I have to attack either of these two. So maybe I just wimped out there. Um, yeah, likewise with a4, I was just trying to make really clear where the targets were. I was hoping for a5, which is a mistake, because that would really, really make clear that the target's on c7. That once c7 moves, b6 drops, and once b6 moves, a5 drops. Um, but black wisely chose not to play a5. Um... It's possible you didn't have to play knight a5 right away, but I don't know what else you're going to do. And this threatens knight c4 anyhow, so... Stops queen c4 also. Looks good. Um, queen e4, trying to trade queens, because now that the knight's out of the center, uh, I have access to this square. So I've changed my plan from going after the pawns to just trying to trade queens. So I successfully trade queens. Um, okay, yeah, as I said, rook e8 was the best move. Oh yeah, yeah, knight, a, knight to a5 gives you that c5 option. In particular, if you don't move the a pawn, you're holding on to that option to push c5 instead of a5. And yeah, that makes it easier to trade pawns, and I didn't see that. But that's actually quite important here. Because every pawn you trade brings you one pawn closer to drawing. Or getting a two rooks versus rook and knight. We just remove all the pawns from the board. It might 
maybe be winning for white, but it's got to be extremely complicated. No, in fact, it's probably drawn. I think it is. As long as your king's not completely boxed in a corner, and your rook and knight are able to protect the king somehow. Um, yeah, two rooks versus rook and knight is just a draw. Also, rook versus knight is a draw, assuming that the king and the knight aren't separated. But yeah, I played the second best move. In hindsight, obviously rook e8 is stronger, because then I could follow with rook e7. This is the same thing, except the king's on h7 instead of g8, meaning I have one additional target. So, obviously I should have played rook e8. I didn't, I missed it. Too bad. Ah! Ah! So yeah, during the game I missed c5, um, but it could have actually been played earlier than it was played. Even stronger the earlier it gets played, because once c5 gets played, then your rook gets active, um, weakening my center. So, yeah. This is what it is. I take him. Why doesn't black? Oh, ever. The whole point is that supposing instead of taking a7, I choose to take b6. This is a double attack. Um. So yeah, maybe I have a5. This protects the pawn. And there's still the attack on the C pawn, and it's probably not too hard to attack the A pawn also. And also the king can start to get active toward the center. Um, maybe there's other places to move the knight too. I don't know. This is really clever on Stockfish's part, so... So white takes A7 instead. Um, and then just gets the king into the middle and hopes, well, hope is pretty, not the right word here, because white actually is winning this. Um, yeah, I didn't see c5 either. That's like early endgame. I studied late endgames, studied middle endgames, but I haven't really gotten into closer to middle game territory in terms of what I've studied, so yeah. Um, but yeah, as soon as the king and rook get closer to the queen's side, just either the b6 pawn falls, or this a or c pawn get traded for the b pawn, and one of these two pawns is going to come. So back to here. Got rook c6, which I thought was interesting. Um, of course, I didn't see d5, but what's the point of d5? What's this do? Okay, so king f8 is kind of that's clever. Uh, let's see. What's going on? Okay, backing up. Why is this king f8 best? Why not just attack this pawn? I think the amp. No, I was just say I think the answer is d6, and knight takes d6. But I don't think that that's what's going on. Um, why is d5 so useful? I don't get it. Everybody's bad at chess. Little known secret. Um, happened to get lucky to get a position that I've seen very similar positions to before, and I could just play bishop a3, avoiding the weakness of f7. And, um, I just got lucky that we played into that kind of position. Really, I think the rest of the game was very interesting. Um,
Sure, yeah. I mean, from that perspective, d5 is good, because um, rook takes d5 isn't going to happen. But suppose that black doesn't take d5. In fact, it's not his turn here. What's white supposed to do? Oh! <laughs> the rook's trapped. That is so clever. I assure you, I would not have seen that. Um, that's why I didn't even consider d5, because I was not looking for trapping a rook. And so yeah, the way this plays out is rook takes rook, knight takes, knight here, uh, rook takes, knight takes, and how do we win this? Check over um, yeah, rook a8 a5 a6 and this is just okay so assuming we don't do a5 assuming black tries to stop the pawn can I just take a7 6 no that doesn't work um Oh, okay, so now the knight has to move. Um, and we learn that this is not so simple, don't we? Okay, so this... Um, I guess c4 here, and then we kick the knight, and then the pawns race, and this is easily winning. Yeah, so the point is once you trade the rooks, the king's way out of the action. Fast pawns are too fast, and the pawns over here are too weak. So, that's why I didn't see d5. That's why Stockfish recommends this completely nutso sequence, uh, starting with king f8. Because it realizes that rook c5 lets the rook trade happen in the end game's completely winning for white. Um, so even though white has this now mate threat on e8, and is threatening to double rooks on the 7th, and this looks absolutely hideous, um, there is this move. I don't claim to... Um, okay. Yeah, I guess taking e6 is the only thing that can be taken. And white's pawns have been stopped, but white controls the 7th rank, and Stockfish says this endgame's winning, and I do not question that. The king can easily make it to d4, and once the king makes it to d4, everything falls. And, um, so, yeah, Black's just trying to trade off all the... trying to attack a4. Um, not sure what else is going on there, but... Maybe he's trying to also attack c3 and try to get some perpetual between attacking the a-pawn and the c-pawn and the a-pawn and the z-pawn. White going rook a7, rook c7, rook a7, rook c7, because rook c4 good. Put it mildly. Um, maybe black is coming for some sort of perpetual. Why white plays a5 rather than dance back and forth. Um, Let's just open some lines. Those get traded. I wouldn't take d5, but I guess if the king can protect the d-pawn, then maybe this makes sense. Um, Blackfish is crazy. Um, I'm almost certain that I just play rook a3 here. And king f1, king e2, king d3, king d4. Got to be the easiest winning idea. Incidentally, I am working on generating um, table bases that Stockfish can use to better analyze endgames. Um, well, no, I was saying, I'm sorry, but I do want to analyze this. 
I know John wants me to look at his game too. Uh, he's, I don't know if he's still here or not, but um, and I do want to look at that, but I don't want to miss out on this end game. This is what I mean when I say nobody studies end games. Like I go through my own games trying to understand everything that's going on because rook end games are awesome. Amazing what complications lie in these end games. So a few pieces on the board. Um, so rook d6 is inaccurate. Oh yeah, as I noted, because I could just play rook e7. Okay, yeah, I guess maybe I'll give you a break here, because um, here I've won a second pawn, and once I'm up two pawns, um, even if there is technique, uh, regardless how good or bad that technique is, um, doesn't really matter. Um, Oh, no, I'm curious though. What about this rook a7? Not this. Oh, just play f3. Now I take the a pawn, and then we get this end game. And I, I know I can win it. Yeah, the, these are advanced end games. Like I've studied rook end games. I've studied bishop end games. I could tell you which bishop end games are winning, which ones are drawing, which ones with knight versus bishop or bishop versus knight are good or bad. Um, for all these reasons that, like in Blitz and in Bullet, you'll see me go for particular end games because I just happen to know like what's good and what's bad and what offers chances and what doesn't. Um, so. This is like why I'm able to swindle so often and what contributes very much to my bullet rating. That even though I don't really know openings, I'm able to play end games at a reasonably high standard. Okay, but yeah. After rook f4, I think I played pretty accurately the rest of the game. Um Yeah. Oh yeah, obviously you didn't see the. Oh, okay. You mentioned you didn't see my rook back. You're probably referring to my rook a1, rook c1, all my dancing and maneuvering here. But secondly, to this rook e6, rook going back this way. Um, obviously that was missed. But I mean, what are you gonna do? It was a tough position. This is really well fought from black side. Um, Really, the only thing that went wrong here uh, in terms of the end game was just playing rook d6 and just oversight that one of the pawns was going. Oh, I'm sorry, that's what you mean by rook pack is this move. Yeah, just a tactical oversight, but the rest of this end game was very well fought. Um, Yeah, so other than just this one tactic, I thought Black played this end game as well as anybody could have played it. Um, I don't think most players below expert would have found c5 in this position. I think you'd have to be like 2,000 or higher to find this kind of move. I wouldn't at all fault anybody for not finding that. Yes, this is a way you could improve upon what you actually played, but um, it's only really an improvement because the alternative allows this d5, uh, rook c5, rook b5 line we were just looking at. And that's not easy to see either. So, yeah. I think that probably defended that as well as I would have or anybody above me would have played it. Um, okay, so yeah, if you'd seen all that, you're saying that instead of playing rook d6, dropping the pawn, um, where was this rook d6 again? Oh yeah, you would have played uh, king g6 here. Yeah, 
you're, you are curious how I continue. Um, you know, I was trying to work through this myself as well. Because, um, I mean, my idea was that my goal is that I want to activate my pieces. But I have so many weak pawns, so many holes in this position, um, it's extremely hard for me to develop without um, either giving one of the pawns away or making some other kind of concession. Um, uh, and yeah, here I was trying to decide between like King F1, King E1, and so forth, or F3 or G3. I think I would not have played H3. Uh, and I think I would have not played H F4 either, because F4 just makes more pawn weaknesses that can be exploited. But my king is, let me get rid of all these highlighted squares. My king wants to be over here. Now obviously this is a huge, huge problem, because my king is a sitting duck here. But my goal is that I want my king to attack C4. I want to generate some activity with some threats with my rooks, force this knight to move away, and then have a rook somewhere supporting this pawn so I can play c4 once the knight is moved. Then after all of that, I've got to reshuffle my pieces all over again based on wherever they are located and see, like, can I manage to play... Can I somehow attack this a pawn and play c5? Can I like double on the seventh with my rooks and threaten either take on c7 or f7? Um, I mean, this would have gone on for quite a while. I'm not sure how I'd play. I, I'm guessing f3, and we'll just say king f6. Now, obviously, if f3, I would continue king f2. Let's just say king g5 happens. Um, here, it would have been very tempting for me to lash out with h4, and I would have considered this ultimately rejecting it because it doesn't do anything. Um, h4 would do something if you were forced to take, but you're not. You just leave your pawn on g5, and then I'm looking silly because I don't want to take g5. I would have ruled that out. Who knows how long it would have taken me to figure that out. Um, another thing I'd want to have done would be like play rook e8 and rook h8 hitting this pawn. Um, but you just play king g7, or king anywhere else, and this pawn's defended. So I'd have to rule that out also. Um, so I'd probably settle on, or realize that I can't advance anything on the queen side, and either I've got to move my rook somewhere. I guess it would have to be a2, which allows rook e6. Uh, so I don't really have anywhere to put my rook without giving up my a-pawn. So I would have realized that I have to play king f3, king e4. To do that, I need to play g3 first. Meanwhile, you're just pushing your pawns, trying to trade them off. Um, and now I'd be concerned that if I play f4, you just play g4. So hopefully I would have found that I could play h4... Maybe I would have played h3 here and hemmed and hawed for who knows how long until I figured out that h4 is my only way forward. But yeah. yeah this is an interesting endgame for sure. And having studied it or learned something from it anyway, um, if I see this over the board, I'll know what to do. Yeah, this, this is a hard endgame. Maybe one thing I could do to improve my circumstances would be to play rook c2 and rook e1, or rook c2 guarding b2, and then my rook could like go elsewhere. Um, but I was kind of content with the rooks being where they're at here. At least this is safe, and in a simo I'm not going to blow it somehow. Um, Yeah, we'll take a look at that in a bit. I think we're almost done with this game.
Um, in fact, yeah, I think we've covered this game. We're debating, like, if you'd found King G6, what would I have done? Hopefully I would have found half of these moves. If not, I would have ended up shuffling my pieces until I find that I can't push my A pawn, I can't push my C pawn, I don't want to push my D pawn. And I would have had to figure out which of these pawns on the king side to be moving. I think eventually I would have found something. Although, hopefully, I would have settled on H4 and not F4. Yeah, thanks for a game. It's, it's helped me learn my Rook vs. Knight endgame technique for sure. And also now I have a better idea of... Well, no I don't. I guess I have a better idea of what's going on here with D5 so early. Um, but no, I just don't get this. I just don't get it, period. Um, Stockfish really likes this. White has a lot of pressure, but I think black can unwind and do pretty well. So let's take a look at this. Um, well, sorry, John was next in line, so let's take a look at John's game. Um, so here we are. Okay. Yeah, we started off with Scandinavian with Queen D8, which is fine. That's definitely a line. I play G3, which is what I tend to play against the Scandinavian in general, because um, I haven't really studied this so well. I mean, here's what I know. I, uh, let's get the analysis board out. Um, here's what I know is that Queen A5, D4, D6... Knight f3, and I think maybe bishop g4 now. And I just know this is like uncomfortable for white, and I've played it so many times that I'm tired of playing it. Because I haven't put in the time to study this, and it's uncomfortable. Um, so, in general, I've just been playing g3 and forcing black out of book. Although black is now pretty much equal here. So if I were serious and wanted to like win in a tournament, I'd have to play something other than this. This is good enough for white to equalize. Um, because here, I'm playing d3 instead of d4, and it's far, far less ambitious. Um, so, yeah... Obviously, there's a choice here between bishop a5, bishop e7. Um, I think both moves are good. I don't know. And I'm not the opening expert. Um, yeah, bullet... I'll just say that bullet isn't chess. Um, it's not going to help you improve at chess, but it can be fun to play. That's not a way to learn. Um, okay, yeah, bishop b6, I thought this was good. And, like, over here I was debating, do I play knight a4? And in hindsight, I should have played it. I should have seen that this bishop was going to be the strongest piece in black's entire army. And that trading to get it, um, here's what I was afraid of, bishop d4. And I don't know, like, if I'm supposed to take here or if I'm supposed to just pack the bishop. Um, like, if I play c3, black... Okay, I didn't even calculate here. That's my fault for not calculating. I should have been calculating. Um... Yeah, that's what I was afraid of. I'm probably mistaken to have been afraid of it. I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, like trading this knight for it's probably not the best trade. Uh, but I don't know how good this is either. 
know, if I just bothered to calculate, I might have actually found this and not been afraid of it. I might kick myself for this later. Uh, so what else? Um, being irrational here, because unlike the Italian opening, where I consider the Italian to be a sideline in terms of opening theory, people know the Rui, people know the French, people know all kinds of other openings, but they generally don't know the Italian. That's kind of why I picked it, is because I don't want to play main lines of main lines of main lines. I want to play sidelines of sidelines that still happen to be good, or at least playable and fun. Um, so, yeah, I should have just played knight a4, taken the bishop, and then see where we get. Um, so your plan was to attack f2 from the beginning, and I just let you go ahead and do it because I wasn't playing well. Um, I just didn't understand what was going on here. Oh, you're asking why this has no computer evals, because I haven't hit the evaluate button yet. Um, I don't yet think that I need it. Later on in this analysis, I might want it. But this is just me trying to dump, like, what was I thinking during the game? Um, yeah, so here we are, knight g4, kind of let this happen, f1, e5, this is really, this just punishes white for not having paid attention. Um, and we got knight d4, and again, Black is, like, super-duper active here. Oh, and I ruled out knight a4. We'll eventually get the computer avail on this, but... Um, yeah, I think this was excellently played in the opening by Black. Then e4, again, really good move, exploiting the fact that um, I can't take the pawn. So, yeah, then I get into this end game where I've got a weak D pawn. Like, very, very well played. Um, minus the fact that maybe somehow I could have earlier in the opening forced this trade, and because I failed to pounce on that opportunity right away, I just blew it and got this lousy end game. Yeah. Um, I understand wanting to capture toward the center. We'll let Stockfish judge later, but I thought that this allowing me to do bishop e5 and do d4, I thought this was very good for white. Um, one thing I should have... Well, I considered this. I did. Um, where were we? Bishop c3. I was considering bishop takes f6. This is where I'm talking about knowing your endgames. Um, I was of the opinion that this is not a winning endgame for white. That the best that white can get out of this is a draw against good play. Alright, so we're talking, yeah. You know, it's definitely very similar thematically. Um, one side having lots of active pieces and really strong central control. Yeah, you were expecting knight takes bishop and figured it was better just to activate the rook. Yeah, as you're saying, taking toward the center is very natural. Um, I just think tactically this allowed me time to either double the pawns or play rook d1. Um, and I guess I was expecting to take here. I double this. And I still think this. Um, oh, what do I think about this? Wait, where were we? Where were we? We were here. 
Oh yeah, what I was expecting was knight d5, and then knight takes bishop. And um, I like to capture toward the center, so I probably would have taken b takes c3. And try to throw all my... Well, I don't know how I would have played this, but I, I think this would have happened so I would be able to play d4. And we have a bishop endgame where all my pawns eventually make their ways onto dark squares. But materials level, and I have more pawn islands than black. So this should be drawn. Yeah. You're hoping to get the bishop out, which is why you pushed c6. Um, I just think tactically, though, this let me keep both my bishops if I want to. Or it could let me double the f-pawns and then go into the same position with the f-pawns doubled. For example, um, f6, gf6, or gay d1. And probably best here is rook d4, stopping me from playing d4. And this, I mean, I'll give you, this is a really murky position for white. But um, having these pawns on light squares can't help black. I don't like, I'm really not comfortable with this. So, sure, it was natural to get this out, because this locks my b-pawn down and my pawns aren't going anywhere. Um, less natural, mentally, like, to play this c takes b6. Um, but, what am I trying to say here? Yes, it takes a little bit longer for your pieces to develop. Um, But I think this position is harder for me to attack. This is more solid because you don't have a pawn on a half open file. And there's fewer pawns that are close to this diagonal. Whereas the other way you have a pawn on c7, which once moved to c6, is on this diagonal and it's just potentially a target. Um, well, so, I mean, you have to, there's balances in this kind of endgame. Um, one thing is that it's going to, I mean, my rook is trapped behind my pawn, right? So, okay, the one thing that's different here is that this bishop is kind of locked behind this pawn. How do we unlock it? I think the solution there... It's just black plays knight d5, bishop e6, and rook c8. And I think this um, would be black's way to equalize and possibly get a better position. So, yeah, the rook is, at the moment, it's barricaded and locked in. But these pawns are really hard for bishops to get to. So this is how I conceive things going down, is c takes b6. I play bishop c3 because I want to try, like, okay. Point one is that I can't move my bishop without losing this. If I moved it to e4, take e4, and then take d2. So that's not an option. So I would have played bishop c3 to allow me to play rook a to d1 protecting this. I'd hope that you would not take this. Um, you would probably take this. And, or maybe you don't feel like doubling your pawns is something you want to do. Um, instead of taking, you just play knight d5. I guess you'd probably do this. Um, and, okay, I could trade into an opposite color bishop endgame. Um, now I have to defend this pawn.
Actually, I don't want my king there. I want my king here. Um, actually, maybe I don't have to defend this, because this one's more important, but also more vulnerable. But basically, you have this double attack if I take on d5. So if I go into this end game, I'm going down a pawn to do it. Um, and my position is full of holes. Um, yeah, I might play a little bit more today. Um, so yeah, I was expecting knight d5. Um, I don't think I'd go into the send game, though I might. Um, my goal was to defend this, so I probably would just continued here. And maybe you bring more pressure on this pawn, and I don't know what I do. Just this. So I've got the bishop here, but who cares? Black's development is like perfect here. And so I've successfully defended my d pawn, and now what would be a c pawn on the C file comes under attack. Um, I guess that compels me to trade into this opposite color endgame. Even though, again, my position is like like Swiss cheese, it's completely full of holes. And my bishop's in the worst possible place. Bishop's very well placed. Um, not where it needs to be. Both of my rooks are behind my pawns. Like, hard to get a better position than this for black, but I don't know if this would be a win for black or not. Like, if I thought this were winning for black, I probably wouldn't do it. But I don't know where this would go. Fortunately, I guess for me, got into this position instead, and these pawns were just ever so slightly more susceptible to being targeted, especially after c6. Now pawns on the b file are kind of, I mean, sure, there's an immediate obstacle, but long term, it's going to be something that needs to be defended. So, yeah, now I just defend. Um, this bishop excursion thing I went on was just foolish. I should have just taken the knight, pawn takes, e4, and we have an end game. Doesn't work. Not work. I can't play d4. The rook d4 is going to happen. Still very unpleasant. Oh, I shouldn't trade. But that doesn't make bishop e5 correct either. I didn't get anything out of doing this. Um, yes, so rook d2, rook e8. e4. Knight d7. Yeah, this f4 is too complacent. I didn't imagine that knight b6, knight c4. For this, I want my bishop to be on c7 instead. This was my mistake, because I should have played there right away. Um, you would have been able to kick my bishop. And then, like, once I'd inconvenienced your rook, so it's not able to capture on a3 anymore. Or maybe you do it with the other rook. Um, but either way, I'm getting something. The way I played, I didn't get anything, and this knight just hopped into the position and ripped me apart. Um, so anyway, b5. And here I am thinking that la -di da everything's just A-OK. -okay. I could slowly build up and apply more and more pressure. This is the moment I think I needed to just 
Last shot with D5. Um, this does block my bishop. Uh, I guess it might even allow C5. But, like, unless I play D5, um, uh, my position is just going to get worse and worse. But now this pawn stands in the way of my bishops. I guess maybe I play d6 because no reason not to. Um, but yeah, it's really difficult for white to make any progress here. Oh, and I was trying to move my king out. That's why I was moving the rook over. Um, and I guess bishop d5. I want to try to trade off the bishops so we get a bishop versus knight endgame. Again, black could probably draw this. So now, having done this just preliminary dump of what I've been thinking and my personal thoughts on the game, let's see how well I did. Stockfish will start analyzing, and we'll go back to the beginning. See, like, did I point out anything that I should have pointed out? What did I miss? Um, and do I disagree with the computer about anything else? Yeah, bishop d5, c4 might happen there. Not too worried about c4. Maybe I should be. Um, well, that was one of these lines somewhere. Because once the pawn's on a light square, and that's the that's the non-doubled pawn. Once the pawns are like this, I can barricade on these squares, and these pawns will forever stop the bishop from being able to move everywhere it wants to. Um, so let me see if I can find that variation again. Um, oh yeah, this is where I was saying, oh, this is earlier, I was saying bishop c5, 7, Rook here, I would have gotten something for that, but game instead continued d5, and I missed d5 here. Five is pointed out by Stockfish. Rook c1 is what I was thinking about because I want to do that in king f1. You know, king f1 kind of runs into bishop c4 at the moment. Um, oh, my 31 bishop b4 confused you. What was I trying to do here? Other than just not get my bishop attacked. Did I miss something here? Because knight c4 attacks both the bishop and the knight, or the pawn. Um, Doctor says I should have just played d5. Easier to find after the fact. And I'm, maybe this is what you're talking about. If you're asking why didn't I just play d5, and my answer is that um, for whatever reason I just thought it impossible to play d5. Maybe because in that other game, the Italian game, uh, d5 was in no way on the table in the opening. So I was just thinking in both games that I couldn't play d5, where here clearly I can, because this knight isn't on b6, it's on c4. If we're on b6, the d5 would be laughable. Um, but here, not so obvious. Yeah. Well, d5, take the pawn anyway? Wait, okay. Yeah, I guess I have to do that. Five's not possible here, I guess. Really messy. I don't understand it. Like, why back here would black play rook d8 and s oh, duh. That's why. Okay. Yeah, rook d8, six takes, and eventually, hopefully, I'll get to trade a rook or two here. We'll get a two bishops versus bishop and knight endgame. 
And maybe I can trap the knight or something stupid like that. Um, actually, maybe I want just the two bishops and rook versus bishop, knight, and rook. Maybe trading the other rook makes it too dryish. Um, oh, that's clever. Yeah. And this for sure is a draw. So I didn't see any of that. I just thought d5 was unplayable because I imagined the knight were here. And I imagined you had a rook covering d5 and like generally black would never let d5 happen. So I just assumed it wasn't possible. Um, no, clearly it's possible in many positions and I just didn't see it. How'd this finish up, by the way? Knight takes b2, so black's slightly better because I just blew a pawn for no reason. Um, yeah, I thought I was getting some compensation here because this bishop's locked away and um, this knight's not able to go too many places. Or at least knight would have to go back to b2 and then to c4 or something. And yeah, there's a blunder. Blunders do happen. This could have continued knight b2, check, and that. I saw those three moves. I didn't see d5. Probably would have ended up playing rook f3, and who knows? Would have been anybody's game. Um, but in so many of these positions, d5 is strong. And I just didn't see it. Uh, so let's go back to the beginning, like I was intending to do before I distract myself. Uh, like I said, this isn't the best opening for white. D3 is super unambitious. A3 is fine. Okay, Stockfish doesn't like A5 and recommends Bishop D6 instead. I did see Bishop D6 during my post-mortem here, but I thought it just looked absurd. Um... I figured, like, what if white just plays knight e4 or something? Why would you want the bishop there? I suppose, and I wasn't sure about this, so I didn't mention it. I suppose this is fine. And this pawn blocks the bishop. And actually, I've had... How many years ago was it? Um... Must have been, well, was roughly a decade ago, I had a position, I was playing the black pieces, and my opponent did just this to himself, where he put his pawn on e4 and his bishop on g2. And I should find that game. But basically, I just threw all my pieces at the king's side and somehow massacred him. Um, that game. It was a really fun one. But it all came back to the fact that black was, or white wasn't able to attack anything because um, this bishop was cut off by the pawn. So this all goes back to say that bishop d6 actually is a good move. Well placed here, threatens things, yada yada. At some point black might even move c6 and want to move bishop c7 instead of e7. So sure, d6, why not? But why is bishop a5 bad at all? Um, yeah. Stockfish and I are both claiming, based on the game continuation, that this is just superior. Um, okay. Oh yeah, you're pointing out that you really like this, that overall, this is a pretty high quality game. Um, until that blunder at the very end, which I'm sure probably doubled your average loss. Who knows how... I've been pushing to get this metric onto Lee Chess, called median centipon loss, which says like, what's your typical loss per move, as opposed to how much did I lose on average? Because dropping a rook will change the average just a bit. I think both of those numbers are important. 
in my opinion, in terms of consistent play, um, the median is way more interesting than the average. But anyway, I just developed... And I moved a piece twice in the opening, and I didn't even get anything for it. Like, I'm sure if I come up with a way to activate my rooks, um, Stockfish wouldn't have laughed at me so badly. Oh, wait, wait. Why did I move my rook to e1? I moved it to e1 to stop on to e5. Um, I really wanted to stop pawn e5. Another thing I could have considered, and I did consider, was queen e2. And then rook a to e1. And this would be building towards some kind of attack with knight h4, f4, f5 maybe. Um, or maybe instead of knight h4, which might get hit by g5, I don't know. Maybe I'll just do knight e5. Kind of weakens d4 and yada yada, whatever. Um, but basically, I went back and forth between two plans. One between controlling the center, and another about trying to place, trying to build up an attack toward the king side. Um, I just really like attacking the king. And takes punishing moves like knight g4. I debated rook e2. Rook e2 is probably best, but I played rook f1, thinking it didn't matter. And yeah, here things really tilt in black's favor. Um, or at least things trend that way. I at last strike upon this idea, but I miss that e4 is playable. And we get into this endgame, which... I mean, this is a cool endgame. Equal, equal, equal. And I play bishop c3, which actually isn't best. I guess allowing rook takes pawn, either it's not best, or like maybe rook c1 was better, or maybe, wait, what was I looking at? During the game I saw rook c1, rook d3, and then I have to move my bishop, and I can't take c7. Maybe the better idea is bishop f4. <laughs> so we got bishop d2, bishop f4, bishop d2, bishop f4. I didn't like this because of knight d5, where my bishop's not really that effectual. Um, But I guess knight d5 isn't playable right away. Uh, that's not playable right away either. Okay, yeah, this actually does look equal. This black has to defend this pawn somehow. Um, not just the pawn, but the square itself. Because I'm threatening to bear rook c1 on it also. A move like rook d7 is not going to solve the problem. You actually have to defend the square itself, so I don't get bishop c7, bishop b6. The solution to that is knight to e8. And this does look equal. Both players have chances of winning this. Yeah, I mean... And I've played games against Zug Addict, or um, John, and I've gotten the worst positions out of the opening against him ever. And, I mean, sure, he plays like 25 people at once, so I still have some chances, but I've gotten ground down by him, even in my own opening, even in the Italian. While he's giving a sign roll, he just grinds down my opening, and I have no advantage out of it, and I'm playing the worst side of a rook end game, and it's just difficult playing bad positions, it's for sure. Um, okay, yeah, but c6, and now I still keep the pawn, and my pieces are active. Um, 
At least Stockfish isn't berating me for not taking the knight. So that's a good sign. Okay, rook to e8? Really? Stockfish thinks that you have better than rook to e8. I mean, yeah, I keep saying that I think that knight d5 is going to happen sometime. Um, also, another idea is just double the rooks on the d file. It's just really hard for white to do something about this. If I, the farther I push this pawn, the more susceptible I am to c5, as we saw in the other game. Um, yeah, rook e8. Ooh, Stockfish does not like my move. Um, I mean, during the game, after I played d4, I thought this would be my... Uh, this creates imbalances. That was what I was going for, is that it makes a position that any result is possible. Unfortunately, this is very risky. Um, it's better that I just double black spawns or I go back with the bishop. Um, again, transposing into this kind of thing. Um, maybe even this. Maybe I want opposite colors. Maybe I don't. I don't know. I do want to like have two pawns adjacent to each other so that my pawn on the half-open file isn't completely alone. That weakens my other pawn on my other half-open file. So, yeah. I don't know. Maybe I play f4. My king active. This keeps my pawn back on d3 where it's not... Where it's controlling d4, and it's not susceptible um, to some pawn being attacking it. Yeah, f4 might have made a lot of sense. Um, grabbing more space. Okay. Yeah. So... I should show you the... Well, you've seen the last time I played Zog Addict. Um, so, okay. Yeah, obviously I missed D5 over and over and over and over and over again. Um, but that aside, yeah, here I was thinking, well, as soon as I move my bishop away, it doesn't really matter where I move it. I'm just going to play B3 and win a bishop. So I was figuring... Um, I was thinking you were going to play b4 to give your bishop an escape route. Um, so I played bishop to b4, to s both because I'm sick of my bishop being going back and forth and back and forth to f4, even though f4 is a good square for it. Um, but I also wanted to stop pawn to b4, I guess. I guess that's what I was going for. And I was tremendously confused. I was thinking the game was going to continue b6, b3, c5. And all I knew is that this is going to be messy. I mean, that's about as far as I took it. I think I was playing take, take. Um, yeah, I don't know. But we have doubled a pawns, tripled b pawns, and an isolated d pawn. And, oh, wait a second. I've got this. So, yeah, C5's not immediately happening. Um, yeah, all I saw this is kind of messy and that this bishop is trapped. Well, what we saw though, this bishop F4 was a blunder. I'm sorry, you're talking about Zug. Yeah. Yeah, Zug was way too speculative in his attack. He likes to do these romantic things. And that's what I was going for, too, with my play. I didn't care who was going to win that. I just wanted to see something happen. I just got lucky. Um, yeah. There's some players who just don't like complications, especially if you can play consistently the whole game. Um, no sense in complicating things. 
Like you saw in the other endgame where I traded queens. Okay, it wasn't the best move, but it got me to where I needed to go. Um, here, this bishop a4, knight c4, and so forth. Um, okay, arguably, if I had seen what was going on and found d5, I could have refuted this, but uh, I guess bishop b4, knight takes b2, gets black where he needs to go. Up a pawn. And white doesn't have especially much compensation for it. Unless white plays d5 in a hurry, this is going to go south for white. Oh, I'm sorry you felt that way. Um, honestly, I felt pressure to move quicker and quicker as my time was running low. Um, I think I was down by 20 minutes at one point, and I'm like, I, I've got to keep moving here. Um, that's where my anxiety was going from. It's like, uh, how do I continue playing, trying to find the best move, explain what I'm doing, and balance that with um, not losing the game. Yeah, and then we had knight d1. Obviously the idea here is that the knight's protected by the bishop, and that with the knight here you can afford to play rook to e1. I mean, there's no other reason to move the knight here other than this rook e1 tactic. Um, but I did allow knight to e d1 to occur. Because uh, this was too good to be true. And that's all she wrote. Um, so, and I have to apologize to Origami Captain, who's probably left at this point, but let's pull up his game. Um, yeah, bummer. Well, I guess he can watch this on the past broadcasts. He was saying this is going to be simple. He was saying, what was it? What was he saying? That's something here. Rolling up and down looking for, oh, there's the link again. Um, shows a line where at the end of it show while moving the rook a1. Oh, why, why is there this line on, I guess, move 7? where one player just keeps shuffling back and forth. Yeah, so it's saying, where are we? Okay, somehow I lost, that's really weird. My chat window lost its dark style, and so now my monitor is blazing, and it's really hard for me to see the board with the chat window illuminated so brightly. Um, Oh, I see. Cool. So, yeah. Origami Captain was asking earlier what's going on here. Why? Let's look at this. So, takes, takes, rook c1, c3, bishop c2, rook e1, takes, rook to b1. And I guess this question. Um, is like, why did white play rook to c1? And then... I guess he's asking why is he moving it back to b1? Maybe he's asking about this other line. Yeah, let's take a look at this. So, c3, an alternative was takes, 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 d4, knight d7, d Castle, castle, d5, rook a1, a3. Oh, okay. Here, he's asking why does white bother with rook c1 and then play rook to d1? Uh. Uh. Okay, but no, seriously. Um, I think there's got to be a reason. Okay. What, what's white doing by moving the rook twice? 
I feel like I might have seen this before. Um, that's really weird. He was promising me that I would find the answer really quickly. Or that it wouldn't take much time for me to figure this out. I'm not thinking that that's the case. Okay, what's the significance of rook to c1 if white just intends to follow with rook to d1? Okay, well, I'll challenge the audience. You guys tell me what's going on. I mean, I guess this is a bit of shadow boxing, right? So, I mean, looking at the moves in Fritz or whatever as they're suggesting isn't going to help. Unless you happen to know why this move is played in the first place. Um, and I guess you could play Rook to D1 and see what happens, right? I don't know what's going on. Why don't I just play Rook D1? Stockfish. Let's play it out. <laughs> Oops. Need to back up one move. Sure, I'll take white. Level 8. Here we go. Rook D1. D4. Okay, what am I supposed to do? I don't know the French. Like, I've been telling people the only opening I know is the Italian opening. Um, so, how much material am I losing here, and why? Well, I guess for one thing, suppose I take here, and now I move my bishop away so I don't get it traded. Gosh, it would be good if I had a rook on c1, wouldn't it? Um, but okay, this raises the question. Black going to play b4 if I play rook c1? No, black doesn't play b4. Um... And again, if I play rook d1, he's going to play b4, right? I mean, I guess maybe sometimes he alters move selection. Uh, I'm not understanding this one bit. So, okay, rook b8, that's fine. I think you were right the first time, though, Stockfish. I think that if rook to d1 gets played, you just lash out with b4. So I can't take b4. I guess that means that I want to play knight b1. Okay, and now if pawn takes, knight takes, my b pawn's loose. So I guess that means um, defend my b pawn without taking on b4. I've got to play b3. And now I take a3. And again, um, I don't want to trade my bishop for this knight, so let's just move it back. Okay. I have to admit, I did not see f5. Um. Oh, okay, so the point is that if knight c2, queen c1 is able to pin the knight, then knight c2 doesn't work. So I guess f5 is worth considering here. Um, I'm worried that the, he's going to get a pawn storm and overrun my king. I'm going to take... Okay. 
And now what am I afraid of? Um, so... Can I play c3, kicking the knight, and then play b4? Give it a shot. Oh, my queen's attacked. Um, I guess I go here. Let's take that, and ha-ha! All forced. Masterfully played. Um, okay. Really hard for me to see both the board and the chat window, because my chat window has suddenly gone to plaid, I'll say. So it's just gone incredibly bright, and it's actually on... I've got two monitors set up here. I'm able to see the board, and the board is much, much darker than the chat window, which has suddenly gone, like, almost completely white. Very difficult to see and read. Um... You're saying knight to e4 looks exciting. Yeah, I guess so. Um, knight to e4, sure. Um, I guess you're referring to the main game. Because I didn't play a knight to e4. Did black have played? No. Oh, you're talking about here. Okay. I'm confused. So if I play H4, H5 happens. Um, so my only way to really try to continue is to sack something on G6. Uh, easier said than done. Well, knight h4, I was going to point this out. Then I thought, you know, maybe this isn't even worth pointing out at this point. Um, this knight dominates that knight. I mean, I guess I could sack, but black just has tons of defenders. Soon to be tons of attackers. Plus this knight's threatening d3, so that might happen too. Again, I maybe there's a more some different way to express this. Um, like maybe instead of playing rook d1, maybe this is the time to lash out. Or maybe I play, well, I can't play knight h4 preemptively here. Maybe I could play h4 preemptively, but then, no, h5 is dumb. Um, I don't know. I have, I'm able to guess some of these things, but, like, I don't know what to play after h4 here. I just don't know the French. Certainly knight e4 looks interesting, but I have no idea what's going on there. Yeah, knight takes, and then if I try to do anything even remotely ambitious, e3, well, now I'm just cooked. Because there's no defending the knight. Yeah. How does queen d4, like, survive? Oh, so you're threatening... Okay, but... Okay, so I get a couple pieces for the queen. But, I mean, this is dismal. But I played the better move. I took the rook. It's better in the sense that it brings the suffering to an end. Um... We'll just assume that that was 